This building isn't real. None of these are. Around the world, there are dozens of buildings that look ordinary on the outside, but hide a secret behind locked doors and blacked out windows. There's like a little gated area here, so I'm gonna try and just look. So I rounded up my friends Whoa. to figure out what's inside and why they exist. One of these buildings is not real, but I can't figure out which one that is. But first, I want to thank Native for sponsoring this portion of the video. We did a lot of walking in this video, and I usually hate walking because I get really sweaty, I get really stinky, and it's a bad time. Now I've tried a bunch of deodorants in the past, even ones that are marketed toward men. But it was like putting a single delicate flower on a pile of onions. So as a lifelong stinker, I'm putting Native deodorant to the test. Oh my god, I hate it here. I tried lavender rose, citrus and herbal musk, and wildwood and cardamom, which is from their cabin collection. They all smell great, they last all day and they stick around after a workout. Now I found that the wildwood and cardamom was the most effective for me, but I like the smell of the citrus and herbal musk so much that I ended up just buying the matching body wash. It's like a little family that smells so good. Anyway, the deodorant dries fast, isn't sticky, and the ingredients are aluminum free, paraben free, cruelty-free, and vegan. They also have a line that's completely plastic-free. Now, if you click the link in the description and use our code, you can get 33% off a three-pack of deodorant and 20% off any body wash or toothpaste. Now, let's get back to the video, knowing that I just smelled incredible the entire time. I always thought fake buildings were an urban legend. You know, something neighborhood kids say to explain that house on the block whose lights never turn on, just adding some spice to the suburbs. I basically forgot all about it until I was scrolling on the internet one day and I saw this photo. It might not look like it, but this is an oil rig. And I thought, no way. That can't be true. Otherwise, everyone would know about it, right? So I spent the next few days digging deeper and learning that not only are fake buildings real, they are way more common than you might expect. It's not just LA. There's New York, Paris, Toronto. I'm in Toronto, and I have never heard of this. So I gotta get a closer look. Yo, what's up? What? Could I ask you a favor? Sure, I'm so tiny. Am I legally obligated to say yes? <laughs> yes. Fine. You're going to New York, right? Yes, for the pizza video. Nice. While you're there, could you go to the buildings that I am sending you right now? Okay. Are they safe? This is not in my country. Yeah, it's like Paris, which is like, what, a two minute walk from the UK? Please. So you're gonna go? Point. Nice. Yeah. Sick. Thank you. That's two. We got them. Okay. I'm hanging up now, bye. Now while those two do that, I'm gonna explore Toronto. Okay, so I am currently in a, uh, like a town square, um, and one of these buildings is not real, but I can't figure out which one that is. So... Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I've just seen it. Okay, it's probably at this point that I should explain what I mean by fake buildings. Like, what are we looking at? These buildings are not designed to mimic the architecture of a different place. Nor are they empty shells for movie sets. These buildings are different. What we've got here is probably best described by the photographer Robin Collier when he said that buildings like these ones are forms pretending to be something other than their function. The form is usually made to blend into the surroundings, to look like any other apartment in the city or house in a neighborhood. Is it? No, somebody lives here. Okay, I found the right house. This is legitimately not scripted, but I just walked past the fake building. What I was getting confused by was this is all apartment buildings, and then this this right here, you can kind of see that this is all fake. But not all fake buildings are that convincing. Oh, what to tell you? Well, it's underwhelming. It just exists. But all these buildings exist so that the function, whatever is inside, doesn't disrupt the visual atmosphere. So what's inside? It all starts with the sign on the door. High voltage, keep out. There's like a little gated area here, so I'm gonna try and just look. Okay, can I just, whoop. Oh, sick. This is an electrical substation, and it's the only thing inside this house. Holy shit. This is what it looks like when it's not in a fake house. 
Basically, it transforms electricity from the really dangerous high voltage energy generated in a power station to something you can safely use in your home. But it's not just Toronto. There are plenty of places with hidden substations. And this is a fake building. It is actually an electrical transformer. And you can tell it's a transformer because there are a bunch of you will be electrocuted and die signs on the one door that lets you into the building. Other than that, it is basically just a wall. However, fake buildings disguise more than just substations. There are those oil rigs in LA, cell phone towers in church steeples, a nuclear bunker in an Essex cottage, a pump station in North Carolina, and in high density places with tunnels for cars or trains, there are disguised ventilation shafts. On the map, this building doesn't actually have a roof. It's just a massive hole. So, this place was gutted by New York's IRT in the 1900s to bring fresh air into the subway system to avoid carbon monoxide buildup and to serve as an emergency exit. So, that is what fake buildings are usually hiding. But why do these things need to be hidden in the first place? I figured it was a safety measure to prevent curious urbanites from accidentally electrocuting themselves or falling down a ventilation shaft. But it turns out the actual answer is hard to find because I don't think we were supposed to care this much. Fake buildings are basically just gift wrapping on a box, icing on a cake. Like we discovered, the important thing is what's inside. A result of this is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of energy put into documenting the story of the outside, which makes my question of why make very realistic fake buildings very hard to answer. So I decided to try and start at the beginning and look into the history of fake buildings nearby. Okay, so I think I might have something. Back in the 1900s, when electricity was really new and exciting, they put these substations in these really grandiose buildings. This was around the same time that that dude was building this castle in Toronto before he bankrupted himself, but the good times can't last forever, and World War II rolls around. Not good, famously. Economic hardship, rationing comes into play, and a bunch of people are moving towards the city to work in manufacturing, rapidly forming a bunch of suburbs. And what do they need? Ah, oh, I wish I had like an animation. Can I? Ooh, I got it. But what do they need? Electricity. So Toronto's power company is faced with a situation where they need a bunch more substations in residential areas and they need to be cheap to make. What do they do? Well, they found this blog post. Specifically, I found this comment under the blog post. It says that their mother says that their grandfather, Harold Bodwell, was tasked with designing substations to fit in, so he chose houses. Genius, but can we trust the comment? We gotta corroborate. So I found this other article that also credits Harold Bodwell. Unfortunately, in the very next sentence, they misspell his name. Red flag, but we persist. So I go into Toronto's archive of city directories, flip back to the early 1900s, and who do I find? but a draftsman named Harold A. Bodwell. So his middle name starts with an A. What can we do with that? Except go to the Bodwell family homepage. It is an online family tree for all North Americans with the last name Bodwell. Is your last name Bodwell? You're probably on this. And who do I find except for Harold Alfonso Bodwell? And he has a kid, Marion Colton, who in 1937 marries Richard Reed Smith and their child could be none other than M.S. Smith. I don't know what this proves. I just know that I spent the last two days putting it together. I think the thing that's bothering me is the fact that these are electricity services, transit systems, oil companies. They are not known for caring a lot about their impacts on the environment. So why do it? Why are they covering up their infrastructure in fake buildings that are so realistic that you might walk by and never notice. So I tried to look at more modern sources and watched webinars and town halls. Double speed playback was humanity's most important invention. I spread my research out to other countries. L'architecture? De la Rue. I don't speak French. I also realized that the UK has fake buildings and Taha did not need to go to Paris. My lawyers will be in contact. <laughs> it's fun. So I think I have an answer or a theory. Two theories. Theory one starts in a neighborhood with a need, like power, ventilation, or sewage. The kind of utility infrastructure that overall improves lives, but can negatively impact its immediate neighbors, leading to the nickname NIMBY facilities, or not in my backyard. The arguments against these facilities are usually based in lifestyle and investment conflicts, with residents fearing the loss of neighborhood resources. 
potential danger, and other consequences that not only make living in a community less pleasant, they can also harm property value, which alienates people who see housing as an investment, instead of a human right. I understand a lot of these concerns, but sometimes it's just straight up whack. Listen to this dude talk about a parking lot. This parking lot is a hub. It's the heart of a community. It's the hub. Now here's him talking about unhoused people. To increase the population density here with 64 units of people going through the most troubling, difficult times of their lives, this may not be the appropriate place to do it. An affordable house? But motives aside, people with NIMBY mentalities can be incredibly influential in North American urban design. It's because they tend to participate more in local politics, which informs things like zoning laws. So theory one is that developers with essential projects will cover them in incredibly realistic fake houses just to protect the property value and lifestyles of people with NIMBY mentalities. Bummer. But what about theory two? What about this? What an undisguised substation actually looks like. There's a bunch of metal rods and signs that promise they will kill you. Imagine if that was your neighbor. So theory two for why we have fake buildings is just good urban design. Our environment can impact our health simply by how it's designed. It influences our sense of safety and the way we socialize. Aesthetic justice theorizes that just like clean air and access to education, well-designed environments are also a social good, one that can improve our quality of life. If that's true, then it just makes sense to approach designing the form with as much thoughtfulness as we do the function. Because a substation that powers the neighborhood can also make the person next door feel anxious. It's just a bit scary. And a ventilation shaft that clears the air can become the center of mysteries and conspiracies. So theory two is that designers recognize that good function can't exist without good form, and they decided that the best form may sometimes be one that fits in. Into the hearts of cities or quiet suburbs all around the world. Unremarkable. Until you take a closer look. Except for this building.